Welcome. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're taking really good care. Before we get started, let me just say, if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can press the CC prompt and that will allow you to have closed captioning for today's program. So I'll give you a moment to do so. Again, that's the CC at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you to our closed captioners. Welcome again, I'm Dr. Lisa Coleman, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, and I use she and her pronouns. Reporting to President uh, Andy Hamilton, I lead the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, and I work with the deans, internal stakeholders, and, and external partners and constituents to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global uh, inclusion, diversity, belonging, equity, and access and innovation efforts across all of NYU. And this includes New York, Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, as well as all of our other sites globally, and of course, our numerous research centers. Again, I hope everyone's taking really good care. We know these continue to be challenging times for many. As a proud NYU alum myself, I received my PhD from NYU. I'm thrilled to welcome all of our NYU magnificent alumni community, our parents and members of our entire community to celebrate uh, our esteemed alum, and of course, the Honorable Constant Baker Motley. I'd like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our president, Andy Hamilton, and our provost, uh, Katie, Katie Fleming, for their enthusiastic support of this program. I also want to thank all of those who've made today possible. Thank you, Tim Valentine in the Office of uh, University Development and Alumni Relations. And a special thank you to Professor Jewel Jackson McKay for her work in honoring Constant Baker Motley's legacy and for all of her support in organizing today's panel. I would also like to thank our other panelists for agreeing to participate and soon I will uh, introduce their, uh, them with their bios. As always, I also have to thank my amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion. I am thrilled to work with them every day. A very special thank you to Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, who also has been working as an architect on this program, Dr. Autumn Rain, Chris Woods, Tara Nakata, and my entire team in OGI. Thank you. Before we move into today's celebration, I would like to acknowledge all of the frontline workers and those essential workers who support us, care for us, and allow us to be wherever we are in the world. Thank you. Now I'd like to also take a moment to honor those who came before us, our ancestors, upon whose unseen labor many of our institutions were built, and the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. We acknowledge that we are gathered here in this virtual space, but many of our institutions and campuses and homes are located on the unceded lands of indigenous peoples, including those on whose land NYU's original campus is located. NYU also acknowledged that the university as an institution created in the United States was founded upon the exclusion and erasures of many indigenous peoples, as well as the discounted labor of many others. We continue on our efforts to both recognize and dismantle these system, systematic and systemic exclusions. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor those who've come before us and those who've sacrificed. Thank you very much. As I said before, we've seen unprecedented as I've said before, we have seen unprecedented disruption as well as escalations of racism, cis and heterosexism, xenophobia, historic forms of oppression that are all too well known, certainly uh, over these last uh, two years. And while and women within historically marginalized communities, and we must continue to underscore this urgent work of exemplary leaders such as the Honorable Constance Baker Motley. I'm deeply honored that we have come together and that we have the opportunity in this to celebrate and the recognition of this transformational leader in creating justice. The NYU alumni Constant Baker Motley in the 100th year of her birth on September 14, 1921. As you join the session today, the welcome graphic spotlighted a quote exemplifying Motley's visionary approach to her life and her dedication to trailblazing a more equitable future for all. She said, quote, 
I rejected the notion that my race or sex would bar my success in life, end quote. And we are thankful that she had that deep belief. The Honorable Constance Baker Motley was the first African-American woman federal judge, the first African-American woman in the New York State Senate, and the first woman elected Manhattan Borough President. She was awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Clinton in 2001, among other numerous honors. Judge Motley was the ninth child among her, her 12 siblings. Her parents, Rachel Huggins and McCullough Alva Baker, were immigrants from Navis who modeled community activism for their children, and her mother founded the New Haven NAACP. After graduating from NYU in 1943, Judge Motley completed her law degree at Columbia University in 1946. As the NAACP Legal Defense Fund's first woman attorney, Judge Motley rose to prominence as the chief courtroom strategist of the civil rights movement. Judge Motley claimed her greatest professional achievement when she was the reinstatement of the 1001 Black children in Birmingham who had been expelled for taking part in street demonstrations in the spring of 1963. She faced the danger of her work head on, driving through Ku Klux Klan territory to defend the rights of Black students to attend the University of Georgia, to spending hours in county jails across the Deep South helping to secure the release of detained civil rights activists. Throughout her career, Judge Motley paved the way, paved the way, excuse me, as the first in a myriad of political and judicial roles. She became the first black woman, woman to serve in the New York Senate, and as I mentioned earlier, to serve as the Manhattan Borough President. When President Johnson appointed her to the United States Court for the Southern District of New York, she became that first black woman, as I said, to be sent as a federal judge. And she became chief judge of the district in 1982 and senior judge in 1986. Judge Motley was elected to the NYU Board of Trustees, serving from 1968 to 1975. She earned numerous awards and honorary degrees from universities throughout the country, including Washington Square Alumni Achievement Award in 1963. She died in New York City on September 28, 2005, but her stellar legacy remains with us today. It is my extreme pleasure now to introduce our distinguished panelists as we engage in this conversation about Judge Motley. First, um, as we are eager to begin this, I will read, um, I will say these are abbreviated bios, uh, just so you know that because these are stellar uh, 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 professionals in their fields. So I will begin with Professor Deborah N. Archer. Deborah Archer is a clinical a professor of clinical law and co-director of the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law. Excuse me, uh, at the NYU School of Law. Professor Archer is also the president of the ACLU and a leading expert in civil rights, civil liberties, and racial justice. She's an award-winning teacher and legal scholar whose articles have appeared in leading law reviews. Deborah is also commentary, commentary for numerous media outlets, including MSNBC, National Public Radio, CBS, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Professor Archer previously worked as an attorney with the, with the ACLU and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Inc., where she litigated in areas of voting rights, employment discrimination, and school desegregation. She is the former chair of the American Association of the Law Section on Civil Rights and the Section on Minority Groups. Professor Archer previously served as the chair of the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, the nation's oldest and largest police oversight agency. Thank you for joining us uh, today, Deborah. It's a pleasure to have you on our faculty. Next, Professor Jewel Jackson McCabe. Professor McCabe is an American feminist, business executive, social and political activist. She was the founder and leader and spokesperson for the National Coalition of 100 Black Women's Movement in the mid to late 1970s in New York City and for the national movement throughout the United States. In 1993, she became the first woman in 85 years to be in serious contention for the presidency of the civil rights organization, uh, the NAACP. 
With wide ranging experience in both public and private sectors, Professor McCabe is a businesswoman who serves as a director on a variety of boards and is a president, uh, excuse me, variety of boards and has been presidential, gubernatorial, and mayor mayoral appointee, a consultant to major corporations and cultural and civic institutions. She has been featured on news and general interest programs, including Charlie Rose and The Today Show. Welcome, Jewel. It's a pleasure, and it's been a pleasure working with you as we put this program together as well. Again, thank you. Next, attorney Constance L. Royster. Constance L. Royster is the principal of Laurel Associates, LLC, and she is a recognized fundraiser, education, nonprofit, and organizational leader. Attorney Royster has nearly two decades of experience in leading fundraising efforts at two iconic cultural and academic institutions. She served as the first ever director of major giving for the WSHU National Public Radio Station in Connecticut and subsequently at Yale University, her alma mater, as associate director of development at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and then for a decade as the director of development at the Yale Divinity School. In addition, she organized countless civic engagements with notables, including numerous members of Congress, as well as the uh, former Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut, Attorney Royster received her Juris Doctorate from the Rutgers University Law School, Newark, and graduated with a BA cum laude from Yale University, where she is a fellow of the Jonathan Edwards College. Again, thank you for joining us. And it is a pleasure and delight to have you with us today. And certainly, uh, last but not least, of course, we have Mr. Joel W. w. Motley III. Joel Motley is an independent director of the Invesco Mutual Funds and an independent director of the Office of Finance for the Federal Home Loan Bank System. Mr. Motley is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and chair emer emeritus of the Board of the Human Rights Watch. He also serves on the boards of the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, the historic Hudson Valley, and the Greenwall Foundation. Mr. Motley began his career in investment banking at Lazard Freyas and Company in 1985, and he was the founder of Carmona Motley Inc. in 1992. Prior to investment banking, he served as the aide to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, serving as the chief of staff of the senators in the senator's uh, office here in New York City and surrounding communities. Mr. Motley joined the Senate after five years of corporate law practice, which he began at Simpson Thatcher and Bartlett upon graduating from Harvard Law School. He graduated Harvard College, magna cum laude. Thank you again to our distinguished panel for joining us today. And I'm going to jump right into the questions so that you all can hear from our amazing panel. So let me begin um, with our first question, which is really about the relationship to Judge Motley. I'd like to, does, uh, just to begin the conversation by having you describe your relationship with Judge Motley. And can you share with us some of the importance of her work to, and her importance of her to you and her work? And I'll start with Joel and then I'll move to Connie. Uh, I was, I was uh, hoping to go last, but I'll do my best. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, well, obviously, uh, as uh, Judge Motley's son, our relationship was like any other uh, mother and son, uh, and, in, and in many more ways than people imagined. She was, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, just always there for me. Um, I think one of the great things about growing up as her son was that I don't think there's been a, there was a, there was not a nanosecond in my life growing up when I, when I, thought, uh, didn't think that I was uh, the most important thing in her life. Uh, so that really uh, was very, very important for, for me and I think for her as well. Um, and uh, I, I guess there's so many things that one could talk about her uh, career, um, but I think I'll just say that in the last two years, as you mentioned, uh, Lisa, uh, there's been this um, upheaval since the killing of George Floyd in the country that has caused a, a major uh, reckoning 
if you will, with things that have not been reckoned with previously or not reckoned with enough. And as you might expect, that has actually added luster and energy to my mother's legacy. Uh, there was a lot there to begin with, but since the killing of George Floyd, there's been significantly more. Uh, this is one of many um, groups like this for which I've had the uh, privilege and honor to participate in. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Joel. Connie? Well, um, Joel was uh, the son and I was the niece um, of Constance Baker Motley. Um, I am her namesake, uh, which has always been an honor and sometimes something of a burden to live up to. <laughs> Let's just be very straight and honest about that. Um, and of course she was, uh, and still is, my uh, chief role model. Um, there, there's just no question about that. Um, growing up, uh, I knew she was an important lawyer. Uh, I also knew that she was my aunt and an important part of our large and close family. Um, and so she was always present um, for us. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe an interesting and somewhat important for this audience of um, NYU alums to know that, um, you know, she grew up in a very uh, immigrant, uh, open immigrant community. Um, you know, there, there were uh, many different ethnic uh, families where she grew up and mostly in school she was uh, and her family, she grew up with my mother. They were Irish twins, really, 18 months apart. And there was, I think, a very special bond, um, <clears throat> which is maybe why I was named after her. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I imagine that is true. Um, and so often they, the two of them, were the, the minorities in their um, school um, and when it came time for her to go to college, there was no money. Um, 13 children, there was no money for her to go to college, uh, but she was an activist and she was a great spokesperson. And she was um, always speaking out. And she was once heard to be doing one of her speeches by a, a New Haven philanthropist uh, who offered to pay for her to go to college and to law school. And she started out college at Fisk University, but she was not ready for what the Jim Crow South had. And um, that's when she transferred to NYU. So uh, Fisk's loss was NYU's gain. And so that's uh, how we are here today, I think, celebrating um, her centennial under the umbrella of NYU, so. Thank you so much and thank you for that important history. Jewel, would you like to chime in a little bit here? Would I like to chime in? <laughs> I am so excited. I can't I, even begin <laughs> to tell you. Uh, to have Connie and to have Joel and meeting Deborah uh, is exciting to say the least, but Lisa, I can't thank you and Karen enough for hearing me uh, really be a champion for the woman who was one of a kind. I mean, I listened to Joel talk about um, the relationship with his mom. All you have to do, there are wonderful pictures of Joel as a young lad, as a youngster, and Connie looking at her son, it, it, it just, 
makes your heart swell. So you don't really, Joel, have to tell anybody about how close you all were. I mean, she looked at you as if you were the sun itself. Uh, no pun intended. One of a kind, she was an epic figure for me. My mother and father made sure that there were dynamic, uh, accomplished women in my life. And I, in fact, apprenticed with the 100 Black women in New York with uh, people like Anna Arnold Hedgeman and, and Pat Patricia Roberts Harris and Ann Roberts, uh, the great Ann Roberts who worked with my mom. It was Jewel LaFontante that reminded me that that the role model for us all, even those women who were of her generation, was Constance Baker Motley. This epic figure in my life dressed elegantly. Her perfect, perfect cadence. She spoke in low, lilting voice. Case after case, she destroyed uh, <laughs> those that were foolish enough to be in the courtroom against her. She earned a reputation um, of being such a tactician and strategist. So Lisa, for me, I had to model myself after this woman. I loved her elegance. I loved her presence. And I could always call on her. She always supported me it, it, when I was a young girl, before I grew up and felt my oats. And I, I just cannot overstate the importance of the tallest amongst us. And that's Constance Baker Motley, the leader. Thank you so much, Joel. And Deborah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel a little inadequate to join the conversation with these folks. I'm really honored to be a part of the conversation, but I was never lucky enough to have had a personal relationship with Judge Motley or to meet her or appear before her. I've received a, a few awards named in her honor, uh, but I you know, never thought I even had the opportunity to be in the room with her. So um, this is great to be with people who have been an important part of her life. But I do see uh, many echoes between Judge Motley's path and my own in ways I think that have opened up my mind and my heart to what is possible, um, not only for me personally, but what's possible uh, for those on whose behalf we fight. So like Judge Motley, my family came to Connecticut from the Caribbean, in her case from Nevis to New Haven, and in my case from Jamaica to Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, Judge Motley's passion for the law came from experiencing racism firsthand. I think the same is true for me. The lore is at least, and I'm sure that um, folks will correct me if this lore is, is wrong, is that as a teenager, she decided she wanted to become a lawyer after reading a book about Abraham Lincoln. But even more importantly, that she was later drawn to a career as a civil rights lawyer after being banned from a public beach that didn't allow black people. And I first lived in Hartford, Connecticut, a city that bears all the hallmarks of segregation and exclusion. And my parents were eventually able to move us to Windsor, which is a working class Hartford suburb because they wanted us to have a chance for a better life and to be included and have access. Um, but our neighbors didn't want us there and they were hostile and reminded us that they didn't want us at every opportunity they had. And I remember one day waking up and our neighbors had spray painted um, KKK on our house and our car. And I was just nine or 10. And my parents had to explain to me and my younger brother who the KKK was and why our neighbors didn't want us there. And I figured out very early on that I wanted to fight against the racism um, that meant that my parents had to move from a black and Latino community to a predominantly white community in order for us to have access to opportunity and to good schools and to be safe to fight against that racism that sought to drive my very hardworking immigrant parents from our home. And I believe that being a lawyer was the way to do that. And so I think Judge Motley and I both did what black people and other historically marginalized people have been doing for decades. And that's turning our rage and pain into fuel to help drive transformative change. And she really created that path for so many of us who came behind her. 
Thank you so much, Deborah. And that leads us right into our next, our next question is almost as if I planned it. Um, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, so, um, and so when we when you talk about the impact, right, the impact of Judge, Judge Matley, um, I'd like you all to reflect on, and so you've already started some of you talking about your own leadership journeys, right? But also the impact on others in terms of the arc of her career, right, across all of the various landscapes. So to talk Talk a little bit about, um, as you said, Deborah, right? You've even won awards, right, in her name, et cetera. And so um, if each of you could just talk a little bit about the important impact that she's had on so many. And uh, I'm afraid to call on someone since I called on Joel first and he wasn't prepared. So how about this time? I'll just let someone, I, I'm going I'm to let you volunteer. Does someone want to volunteer? Well, I'm, I'm emboldened by my, <laughs> my first appearance. And uh, a couple of things I would say. One, one to uh, uh, refine some of the history. Um, when my mother was told by Clarence Blakesley, the philanthropist in New Haven, that he was prepared based on the incredible speech he heard her give at a community center he'd funded, uh, that he was prepared to pay for her to go to college and law school, um, she decided to go to Fisk because she'd never been to the South. She had only lived in the North, in New Haven. And so her chance to see the South came going to Fisk. And going down to Fisk, when the train got to Cincinnati, suddenly the cars were segregated and she had to move into the black car. That was really, I think, traumatic for her and sort of scary and like, you know, suddenly hurtling into Johannesburg, but here we were in the US. Um, then when World War II came, a lot of the professors at Fisk uh, went off to the war and the faculty was depleted and Fisk didn't have the kind of resources that NYU had in those days. And so that's why she shifted up to, to NYU. Um, Jewel mentioned two of my mother's dear friends and colleagues and contemporaries, Patricia Harris and Jewel LaFontaine. And when I was growing up, those were the two women, and particularly Black women, who were just like my mother in the sense that they, when you met them, they were just overwhelmingly brilliant and charismatic and gorgeous. I mean, just like, queen, just show-stoppingly attractive, you know. So when you look at Jewel McCabe, this is your best chance to imagine what my mother was like uh, as a person because Jewel is really in that same uh, mold with Pat Harris and, and, uh, and Jewel. Jill, Thank you so how much. <laughs> how lovely. You made my, not, not, not just my day, because <laughs> these women as they were in your life meant so much to me and I have so tried to be as disciplined and responsible in intellectual presentation and physical presentation as your lovely mother. And Jewel LaFontaine, she used to tease me that for years people would spell my name with one L because they knew Jewel LaFontaine with one L. And then for 15 minutes I had fame and so she said, Jewel, people are starting to spell my name with two L's. And I said, say la vie. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lisa, I had to respond. <laughs> That's great. It's, it's quite wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to jump in on this, I, this question? Um, I see you shaking your head. Oh, whoever wants to go first. Jewel, please go first or Connie. I'm happy to defer to others. Oh, well, for me, uh, when we talk about recognizing um, Constance Baker Motley, I had the honor of, uh, of honoring her and giving her the Distinguished Service Award at the Candace Awards. It was a, Candace is referenced in the Bible. It's uh, the Ethiopian um, name for uh, empresses and queens. And I thought no more appropriate um, 
title for, for me, a civil rights statement was a Candace Award. For 10 years, I had the privilege of being at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and really honoring women in non-traditional um, African-American stereotypic trope, if you will, um, disciplines. And so in 1984, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women um, presented to Constance Baker Motley, my gentle giant, my intellectual guru, my epic figure, this Candace Award. And what was so thrilling is that from that moment on in 1984, when Constance Baker Motley talked about recognition, even though she had been um, recognized in 1993 by the National Women's Hall of Fame, and that, she, that Bill Clinton had given her the Presidential uh, Citizens Medal, and that she had gotten the ultimate award from the NAACP, the Spengon Award in 2003. She mentioned the Candace Award and the National Coalition of 100 Black Women first. And I can't tell you, I just got chills from what the lovely, um, wonderful thing that Joel just said to me, but his mother meant so very much to me and her recognition was like gold to me. So I became, I was, uh, went to Bard College and I was anti-sorority for a period of time. So when both the Deltas and the AKA came to me, I had to be an Alpha Kappa Alpha and AKA because that was Constance Baker Motley sorority. And so I joined that uh, illustrious club because of Constance Baker Motley. I have a lot of things that I could say, but I would like to hold my, keep my powder dry, Lisa, until we get to um, the legacy section of this dialogue. And that's up next. So, um, I mean, I'm already getting a little teary here. So uh, uh, who wants to go next? <laughs> I'm happy to, to jump in here because um, I have a, a different pr perspective. I think as a civil rights lawyer, I often think of the giants in whose footsteps I walk each and every day and the people who worked and fought before me. And right at the top of that list is Judge Motley. Her career really is an amazing testament to the power of of love for yourself and your community and law to save and transform lives. And in celebrating and reflecting on her life, I think we have to pause to acknowledge the generations of black children and black people who are thriving today, who are living choice-filled lives today, who have access to opportunity today because of her work, her courage, her brilliance and her transformative advocacy and leadership. Many of us in this virtual room would not be here today if not for um, her work. We mentioned Judge Motley's work on um, education, but she wrote the original complaint in Brown versus Board of Education. And more than that, she was a key architect and strategist in the fight for desegregation, helping to develop the idea that separate can never be equal, and then doing the work to make that a legal reality inside and outside of the courtroom. And her work shaped the fight for racial justice, but it also served as a framework for gender justice, for LGBTQ equality, for a lot of the movements and fights that we are seeing today. And I worked at LDF um, as a young attorney, just as Judge Motley did. As you said, she was the first woman to attorney to work there. And her legacy is woven into the fabric of the work that LDF does. How uh, we face and challenge the architecture of systemic inequality, how we face down hate, resistance, and retrenchment are all modeled after the work that she did. And for those who continue to fight these fights, her work and her legacy really do continue to guide us, to provide hope when we think the mountains we face are insurmountable because Judge Motley faced and overcame bigger mountains. Today, it's easy to get overwhelmed when we're faced with the reality 
of systemic inequality. And even the most committed among us can sometimes surrender to feelings of hopelessness uh, despair and an action and may find it difficult to believe in the possibility of change, let alone in its likelihood. But at the end of the day, we have, uh, you know, we're, we're reaping the benefits of the courage and sacrifices of heroes like Judge Motley. And to remember that given everything she faced and she fought for civil rights, we have no right to lose hope. She has paved a path for us and her work really does uh, continue to serve as a guiding light. And I can only hope um, as someone who fights for justice to be able to look back at my career and feel that I have made um, a fraction of the dent and impact that, that she did and continues to. Thank you, Deborah, for reminding us of the long tale of her legacy. And I'd like to, I'd like to add yeah. something else if I could. Wait, I need um, to, Joel, you, you already had your chance. <laughs> you can speak after me. As best <laughs> I can, I will try. Okay. <laughs> This, we're cousins, we can do this. <laughs> I just want to add um, uh, in my turn <laughs> that um, th what we just heard is the amazing arc of the person um, from her professional life to her impact on individuals. And um, from my perspective um, as her niece, um, the the personal uh, leadership and the personal leadership journey has been acute for me mm -hmm. um, because I, I witnessed, um, you know, from I guess day one even, I witnessed her leadership in action. You know, I, she, she led me by the hand in, in many ways without really being, uh, being a school mark. Um, and it's something I learned to pass on. Um, so it was more like um, a, a mentoring journey uh, that was subtle. Uh, and things that stick out for me were things like uh, taking me to Albany when she was in the state Senate, right? Mm -hmm. And taking me to her room, uh, her, her office, when she was a borough president. And I was always in and out of the courthouse. Um, but these are things that were examples to me of how to pass it on. And uh, they became part of who I am. And so witnessing her in action uh, also meant, it, meant for me that I could be a witness to others recognizing how important uh, her she was and how important her leadership was. So when we talk about the awards that she received, we, we need to lift them up. Um, they were significant. It was significant that others acknowledged how important she was. She got to a point in her, her life where she, you know, just said, I don't need another honorary degree, right? Um, but that she did, for example, and I was there when she got the, um, uh, when she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame at Seneca Falls. That to me was a big deal um, for me to be able to pass on, to have been there and to pass on in the Spring Garden Medal. And more recently, the jury assembly room being named for her at the United States Courthouse. So I took these in as examples of my aunt bringing me along um, in her, you know, never heavy handed way. And I do that in my mentoring way with the next generation. That's what we're supposed to be doing, folks, right? We're supposed to be bringing the next generation along. And that's a lesson that she um, gave me. Thank you so much. Uh, let me say this before, Joe, before we jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have our last question soon. So for our audience out there, please um, submit your questions. We have about uh, eight more minutes here. I mean, eight more minutes before we go into Q&A. And so uh, please put your questions in. Joe, uh, please, please go ahead. Well, I, I think what uh, one of the things I'm taking away from what Connie's been saying, and I hope you will too, 
is the sense in which my mother had a, was, had a very integrated life where her personal and family life were as important to her as her public and professional life. And that's something that one doesn't often see clearly if it exists in famous people. Uh, and some it exists, some it doesn't. But in her case, it, it really did. Um, you should all know that uh, Tomiko Brown Nagin, who teaches at Harvard Law School, is completing a very large and comprehensive biography of my mother, which is coming out early next year. And as a family project, we've been helping her find photographs uh, to go along with it. And my wife has been uh, organizing a lot of that with help from Connie. And we uh, came across a photograph of my mother holding me. I was born in 1952. And my wife pointed out, this is when she was drafting the complaint in Brown. Right? That she'd still this, you know, 100% uh, mother trying to, to do this, this other, other stuff. And um, so, but in addition to that, if my mother were uh, here today, advising me on what to say, I'm, I'm certain that she would say, tell them about Clarence Blakesley, who we mentioned, and Thurgood Marshall, because these are the two men, but for whom we would not be having this discussion about Constance Baker Motley. And again, Blakesley, the philanthropist who was very um, self-effacing almost as a philanthropist, who just didn't promote himself, but just wanted to do the right thing for people in and around New Haven, and he did. And then Thurgood Marshall, who hired my mother when she was a second year student at Columbia Law School. And uh, Thurgood was not a women's lib guy. He wasn't out there on some crusade to elevate women. He was a guy of his generation. I mean, he hard drinking and, you know, uh, and all of that. Um, fun, loving guy, uh, but hardworking. Um, but he, he brought her in and gave her all the work that was commensurate with her ability. And she was the only woman lawyer at LDF from 1946 when she started until, what, 1960 something. I mean, it was a long time. It wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, she was the first and then there were three and four and five. She was the only one. Um, and the last point, just to give you a sense of how integrated her life was, um, she wasn't part of the women's movement, right? There was no women's movement in the 1940s and 50s um, as she was growing up. But um, she always looked as she did. And there's a great interview of her in uh, New Yorker of the 1990s uh, by Marie Brenner, who said, you know, you argued 10 cases in the Supreme Court, which she did, she won nine. So court reversed itself on the 10th case 20 years later. And Marie Brenner, the interviewer said, it must've been very nerve wracking when you were going for your first argument to the Supreme Court. What did you do to prepare for that first argument? And she said, well, I went to Lord and Taylor and got an address. <laughs> That's my Connie. <laughs> Oh, yes, Joe. <laughs> well, you know, Joe, I must jump in here for a second. I want to talk about the quintessential leader and all of the uh, historic and, and important strategic and tactical uh, characteristics that she brought to the table. But I tell my students, I usually ask them, I teach uh, uh, leadership women in public policy, and I'll ask them, uh, you know, what is the first thing that you think Professor McCabe does when she has a speaking engagement? And they <laughs> said, oh, well, lay out an, out, uh, uh, you know, develop an outline, uh, do a deep dive on research. Uh, and, and I said, well, th that is a part of the process, but what is the very first thing I do? And they, they never get it. And Joel just hit the nail on the head. I tell them, you find the perfect outfit for the audience that you are going to be speaking before. You make sure that your gloves and your shoes and every item is correct. Because believe me, when you are doing the last bit of research 
and crossing those T's and dotting those I's and making everything uh, perfect. You want to be able to be the vessel through a perfect presentation that makes everybody pay attention to what you have to say. I wanted to add one quick uh, point, uh, Lisa. You know, we talk about her being Manhattan uh, Borough President, and we talk about Bob Wagner, who I used to carry um, petitions for when I was about 16 years old. So I have a, a special uh, affinity for Bob Wagner and the African American women that he surrounded himself with. He was smart and he knew to have an Anna Arnold Hedgeman as his uh, chief of staff. Um, and he knew to have uh, a Mary Burke Nicholas as a, as a protege, whatever. But he knew that Constance Baker Motley would help him run this city. And in 1965, when Constance Baker Motley actually became the second most powerful elected official. She was appointed at that point, but she went on uncontested and ran uh, uh, successfully to be Manhattan Borough President. There was a structure in New York that made the head of the Manhattan Borough President was the head of the Board of Estimate. The Board of Estimate dealt with budgets for the city of New York, policies for the city of New York. She herself, hands on, was probably the second most influential powerhouse in New York City. And that doesn't get explored enough for me. Mm -hmm. Because most people look at borough president as a ceremonial job today. And yeah. we love the proclamations and we love the changing of street sign uh, to the appropriate names. But back in 1965, when it was, and I don't mean any insult, when it was white boy heaven, the borough president had power. Yeah. Yeah. And Bob Wagner, and the city council voted unanimously for Constance Baker Motley, the first woman in New York State legislature to be elected a New York State leader. They made sure that she was the borough president. And when we look at this quintessential leader, we're looking at a person who had been through the appointed process, who had been through the elected process, and who was, as Deborah Archer tells us, a scholar, a lawyer that understood how to codify and make policies that would help us. I think, Joel, you'll have to correct me. I may be misquoting your mother. But I think her goal was dignity for all people. It mm -hmm. was a simple goal, but it was one that she had 20 years of, of successes. They mm -hmm. were so frightened of her in Mississippi, one of the local newspapers talked about that motley woman, that tall motley woman. Well, that kind of signature and brand is when people take you seriously and know that you are no nonsense. This was such a, um, an exceptional person because Constance Baker Motley sang freedom of songs in the churches before those churches were bombed and after those churches were bombed. She went to Mississippi about 22 times and she was dealing with Medgar Evers and way before, uh, uh, you know, you ever heard Meredith's name, Constance Baker Motley had been working on those briefs and working on all of that scholarly research that was necessary for 18 months before you even heard Meredith's name. So I get excited because I tell my students, when you have a person that has been, you know, there's one thing to be an appointed official and we just lost a very important one. 
There's one thing to be an elected official, but to be all three, a noted lawyer, an elected official, and an appointed official that have real accomplishments under their belt and in their portfolio is something rare. And that's why for me, Constance Baker Motley cannot be over-recognized. When we look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg writing tribute to Constance Baker Motley, we understand why. When we look at President Johnson working in concert with Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Robert F. Kennedy, we understand uh, why <laughs> Constance Baker Motley got the Democratic, Republican, and Liberal Party lines when she ran for borough president and was elected. I guess I should keep quiet now. <laughs> Jill, so we are, um, we do have some questions from the audience and we have, and Jill, you've led us right into the legacy question because you talked quite a bit, right, about her legacy and the impact of her legacy, which I, was the last question that we were going to ask. So what I will say to our panelists, and so each one of you can uh, respond to either the legacy question, and then I'm going to tell you the questions that we've gotten from the audience. So the first question really is around um, sort of this idea of the resistances. And this goes back to some of the things that Deborah was mentioning, um, certainly about the arc of civil rights and how far we've come. And Joel mentioned that even as well, but how far we've come and how far we haven't come. And so um, one of the questions, that question is really about the, um, how would we chat, how would we go, how do we continue to go about honoring that legacy of Judge Motley as we, you know, reckon to use what Joel said with, uh, with the future. And then the um, second question, um, which is about cancel culture and the culture wars. So this is a question and I'm sure from our students uh, about the culture wars and cancel culture and all those things that are happening. And they wanna know, how would Judge Motley advise us now? So those are, <laughs> take the ones that you, that you will. And, uh, and I'll just remind everyone I need about uh, four minutes here at the end. So we have about four minutes to answer these questions, six minutes. And so I know, so we gotta be quick and pithy and then I'll, uh, I have to close up uh, with a special announcement. Okay. And anyone can jump in, whoever wants to jump in. Well, there's one quick thing and I'll be quick, Lisa, I swear. <laughs> I swear you won't need a, one of those things like at the Apollo where you have to pull the person off the stage. The, 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 there are uh, cases and I mean, Joel made mention of, I, I think it was Joel or Connie that, she, that Constance Baker Molly wasn't, I'll use the, uh, the F word, wasn't a feminist in the modern day sense. And for me, I claim that she was, as the quintessential leader, she was the quintessential feminist. And when she was at law school, uh, you know, at Columbia and volunteering to work for the NAACP Legal Defense, she was close friends with Bella Abzug, who was dealing with a lot of civil rights stuff, but also dealing with her own developing focus, her being Bella's, on women. And I think about the case, and I'm sure Deborah can speak to it, or Connie can speak to it, the, the, the uh, Ludke Kuhn case is a feminist breakthrough in journalism. And Constance Baker Motley was a pivotal figure for um, Melissa Ludke. So, I leave it there for you to fill in the blanks, uh, you lawyers. <laughs> Anyone want to pick up? We've got about two minutes now. I, I will just quickly, um, hopefully speak to those who are thinking about how to continue to move forward in this uh, fight and challenge inequality. <clears throat> um, and very quickly, I think um, where we move forward now is to continue to do the work that she did, which was to identify the architecture of inequality, the fundamental structure that helps um, racism persist in its power, that helps other types of inequality persist. And then to devise a strategy 
using every resource that we have, every tool that we have to tear down that architecture. Um, and then finally, to do the important and incredibly hard work of building an infrastructure that supports equity and equality. And, and then the last piece, <clears throat> that I think we often tend to focus on short-term victories and short-term vision of justice and equality, to do work that means we're fighting for change that we will never see in our lifetimes, that we are fighting for generations to come to make sure that they are not fighting the same fights and battles that we have fought. Thank you. That's great. And I, I will leave, let Joel have it. <laughs> and um, I would uh, just add that we're not just talking about law and we're not just talking about lawyers here, that every aspect of American life needs advocates and activists to uh, move us forward. And that from my perspective, um, my aunt's uh, leadership model and what she would say to this next generation is find your leadership style, find your leadership quality, uh, whatever best fits you and live it every day. Thank you, Connie. Well, Joel, I have to say, I wanna thank the entire panel for being here, but we have a special surprise uh, for you. And we wanna thank you for being here, but we have a special surprise for you today. Congressman Bonnie Watson Coleman is a member of the US House of Representatives, as well as the Congressional, excuse me, Women's Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus. And she has created a proclamation for us to present to you today in honor of Judge Motley's 100th birthday. <clears throat> it reads as follows. The United States of Representatives Proclamation, Congressman Bonnie Watson Coleman, in recognition of the Honorable Constance Baker Motley. Whereas on this day, we recognize the legacy of Constance Baker Motley and the centennial anniversary of her life to celebrate her impactful career in the field of law and civil rights forever altering the course of the history. And whereas Constance was a trailblazer as the first black woman to ever argue a case before the, before the US Supreme Court, championing civil rights as a key legal strategist, litigator and advocate for the pursuit of public school integration. And whereas Constance continued to shatter barriers as the first African-American woman elected to the New York State Senate, first woman to serve as the Manhattan Borough President and also being the first black woman named as a federal judge, federal court judge. And whereas her leadership with the civil rights movement is recognized by all, exemplified by the presidential Citizens Medal awarded by President Clinton, her induction into the National Women's Hall of Fame and the NAACP Springer Medal. And therefore, be it resolved, we humbly recognize the legacy of Constance Baker Motley's impact that has forever changed the course of our great United States and commemorate the Honorable Constance Baker Motley in celebration of her 100th birthday. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa. That, that is really moving and, and uh, beautiful and, and appropriate. And this has really been a terrific uh, session, uh, one that we will always remember and cherish as a family. Thank you. We we're lucky. We we're lucky to have Constance Baker Motley as an alum. We we're lucky that we were able to celebrate her here today. And I would just like in my closing remarks to echo so many of the sentiments. Uh, I am, uh, I am uh, in the long legacy and history of so many people. And I know that I would not be at NYU uh, at, in my uh, role, let alone have received my PhD as an alum, if it weren't for Judge Motley. So uh, thank you everyone for being with us today. It has been an honor to uh, be in conversation with this amazing panel. I hope that everyone out there is giving them a big round of applause. I know that I am doing that and thank you so much. We're certainly out of time, but I just wanna say thank you, of course, Joel, Connie, Jewel and Deborah. Obviously, I'm not sure our participants out there know. I mean, these are true, truly, gifted individuals and thank you for giving your time to our audience today and talking about the important work of Judge Motley. Um, we will continue to of course honor um, and continue to uplift the work of Judge Motley and the work that we do as uh, Deborah reminded us and we continue to work on these important issues of 
equity uh, and inequality. We invite you to visit our website and our Office of Global Inclusion to learn more about our resources, uh, particularly as we think about anti-racism, inequality, uh, uh, and of course, um, thinking about civil rights. Uh, and to learn more about the future events that we will be hosting in terms of the, to commemorate and continue to commemorate the legacy of the Honorable Constance Baker Motley. Once again, I'm Lisa Coleman, and it has been my greatest pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please take care, everyone.